these people are they're, they're, they're on drugs they're crazy there's these stray pit bulls everywhere yeah. it is a public shame and the fact that this city council and andre gonzalez or whoever, or whoever aren't more upset about this <laughs> that my taxpayer dollars that built these parks that built all of these amenities that we can't use him much much less the business people who come in every day and there's somebody sleeping on their doorstep yeah. i think we got to get much more active in today's show with richard bean um he used to be the ceo of the baker Californian, but um, you're going to enjoy this show today because you're going to learn a lot about the background of Richard, how he ended up here in Bakersfield, what he's done, his viewpoints. He's really involved in our community, really does care about our community. And so we do, we actually cover a lot of topics today, including the homelessness, um, really uh, the changing demographics of, of Kern County, how the big media, how that's evolved over the over the years and, and really what drove that. And you're going to be surprised to find out some of those uh, key pieces that caused the change and and. and, and what happened uh, during all that. And you're also going to hear a little bit about uh, some of uh, the best advice that's been given to Richard. And I really think you're going to enjoy the show today and then stay tuned uh, towards the end of it to hear some of those rapid fire questions that we asked to even learn more about our guests and specifically today's guest, Richard Bean. I should call him Sir Richard Bean, but anyways, thanks. Enjoy the show. Welcome back to the Our Two Cents podcast, the show where your local professionals sit down with an array of guests to hear their story and impart some wisdom for both business and life improving skills. This is your place to hear business and community leaders discuss relevant topics that matter to you. And welcome to the show today. My name is Dave Plivlich with the Marcom Group. And uh, before we get in today's episode, I'd like to encourage our listeners to follow us on Instagram at our two cents podcast. Find us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and on YouTube. Today's guest is Richard Bean, a longtime friend of mine. So I'm thrilled to be talking to him in this setting. Uh, Richard, I'm happy to have you join us here today. I really appreciate you being here. And, uh, Great to be here, Dave. You know? <laughs> well, you're an old hand at this now, man. I mean, this is what you do. I love being. I, I love seeing seeing you in charge. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Who doesn't love a man in charge? Exactly. Well, real quick, before we get into some of the day's topics uh, that we have, my my big question and one of the reasons I reached out to you specifically was. I mean, you were in it. I mean, you've watched how journalism and the medium has evolved. I remember having a conversation with you a while back, a few years ago, and you were like talking about Twitter, you know, and how slow it took to get things into media to where people could find out what's going on. Whereas, you know, if there was a bombing or, or something someplace, you had people all up and down the street twittering and sharing pictures of real-time action what's going on here you can't do that in newsprint and even i own a newspaper now and it's a monthly newspaper in valley ag voice and by the time it comes out well, that news is kind of right. old news but right. there is that demographic out there that wants to still sit down and read that newspaper yeah. so anyways right. back to that question how has it changed i mean oh wow what a question <laughs> it's a loaded question well, well for, first you have to know kind of my place in it okay right i'm 70 years old right I graduated from college in 1973. I mentioned these things not to date myself, but ra rather to, in some ways, the arc of my professional career and what I did. I came out of uh, a public university in South Georgia, Georgia Southern, majoring in journalism, right, and, and history. And I went straight into newspapers and stayed in newspapers for over 40 years until I retired. In that time, day between 1973 and 2016, when I retired, the industry had hyper growth, grew to a point that in the 80s, if you were in the newspaper industry, or God forbid, willing, if you owned a newspaper, you owned a printing press that printed money. You were making so much money. So the arc of the business, I'm explaining this, go, goes up and peaked in the 80s and then came down. And by the time I got out in 2016, it was virtually dead. And let me explain to you why. That I was of the age when I grew up when I was a child, there was no mass media. The mass medium was three network TV stations <laughs> and your local two newspapers. Yeah. So if you were Jim Burke Ford and you wanted to sell a Mustang, you had four people to deal with, three TV stations and 
a newspaper, radio stations too, but yeah. it's generally where your big bucks are going, right. right? Jim Burke had to use print. He had to to sell, and it worked. Yeah. It worked for years. You mentioned the Twitter thing. So go up to 1995 where when Al Gore invented the Internet, and then everything changed, right? And, and what changed was, was simply this. People in the newspaper industry will look back on those days and go, God, we were doing great work. You know, when I was, I, I worked for, for a long time at the LA Times and I was there and, and we had a million and a half subscribers oh, and wow. we were going, everybody reads us. You don't know what's going on in the world without us. Yeah. And particularly as an advertiser, if you want to sell product, you had to use us. Well, what happened after the internet came were all of these things now where we're looking at Twitter and Instagram. What happened was to the newspaper industry is very much what happened to motion picture theaters. When you and I grew up, the top 10 movies in the country were reflected by what was playing at Edwards Cinema and the other places. Yeah. That's the only choice we had. Yeah. So the same thing, if you, were, if you were an advertiser, you had to use the newspaper. When consumers and advertisers have other choices, now there's the internet and there's Twitter and there's Instagram and there's TikTok and there's, you know, consumers have different ways not only to access information about what's going on in the world, but to sell their products. Mm -hmm. So now you have, now if you want to rent a movie, Dave, you don't have to go to Edwards, yeah. you know. Yeah. Netflix comes along, right? Yeah. So, you know, Netflix is to theaters what Twitter was to newspapers. Yeah. You have this enormous choice, and with choice, price points come down, mm -hmm. right? And advertisers figured out, I can sell that Mustang and never spend a dime with my local newspaper. What people don't understand, people think that readers left. Readers stuck with newspapers. Yeah. It was the advertisers that left. And the whole business model became upside down, right? right? Because we had these huge inbred costs. We had this huge printing facility out at Pegasus, yeah. Porterville Highway, yeah. which cost us hundreds of thousands of dollars a year just to keep running. When I joined the California in 1994, we had 425 people working there. You know, wow. 425 wow. people. Yeah. So anyway, it was a robust company, but it was bloated. Super high labor costs, super high infrastructure costs. At the time, we could afford it because we had so many advertisers on literally million-dollar contracts. Yeah. And by the time I left, almost all the car dealers were out of the paper. Wow. Almost all of wow. them. And that so, can't be, and the subscribers can't support that. <laughs> exactly. Because we had conditioned the subscribers, we were giving it away. Yeah. You know, we were subsidizing it for what little we, you know, we charged them to get it on your doorstep. It was being subsidized by the advertisers. Yeah. And as you say, when the advertisers go away, we can't raise the prices on the consumers because we've conditioned them to expect it for $4 a month. What about the transition you guys did to the online space? You know, we It understand. never worked. Really? Yeah, I, I, I wish it did, Dave. But yeah. the, the only newspapers that have managed to do that are the national ones, the yeah. New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. There isn't another newspaper in the country of any size. The California was once what we used to call a medium-sized paper of any size that's made that transition. We couldn't do it. The prices were so cheap. I mean, you're in the business. Yeah. You, you know what, what you can charge. Yeah. We couldn't make it up. We couldn't have $60,000 a year reporter filing digital stuff that we're getting $4,000 a year from. I mean, yeah. it just didn't make any sense yeah. anymore. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it, it, that, that's what happened. It was just, it, I don't think anybody did anything wrong. It just became a matter of consumer and advertiser choice. And at that point, for example, now how we all access our news, and I was mentioning Twitter to you because I I happen to love Twitter because Twitter is something you can tell Twitter exactly what you want it to do and it'll only give you what you want. So example, if I only want to cover the war in Ukraine, that's the only thing I'll get, you yeah. know, and through that I will find reporters, Ukrainian reporters or Polish reporters or English reporters or Middle East reporters on the ground in Kiev writing their own accounts, filing their own video. I don't need the nightly news here. To do that, yeah. I'm getting better reporting, more pure sourced reporting 
on the ground. So that's how I use it. I don't use it frivolous means. I use it just kind of things I'm interested in. Sure, sure, you know? sure. It's valued to me. But, but you can see by doing that, I have supplanted my traditional sources of news and information. Yeah. I still read the New York Times. I still read the Californian. I still read the Wall Street Journal. But increasingly, where I get my information is not from the old traditional sources right. anymore. Talking about live, uh, being overseas and stuff, in your bio that you provided us, you said you spent six years living overseas in Cairo, Madrid, Mexico City. What were you doing over there? I was what they used to call a foreign correspondent. Again, really? back wow. in the days when newspapers were making a lot of money. Yeah. You know, I worked for the Dallas Times Herald and I was in five and a half years in Mexico City. Enormously expensive to have me with my family rent a house in Mexico City, spend 12 months a year flying around. That was in the 80s. It was wow. back. I, I was there because Central America was the big story. Sure. The, the Civil War in Nicaragua and Salvador and Guatemala. And it was a violent place back then. But everybody, newspapers could afford. And, and it was... It was Publishers love to say, oh, yeah, I have a, a you know, I have a, a foreign correspondent, correspondent yeah. who's in San Salvador right now. Yeah. Bragging you know. rights. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. You know, rich kids game, you know. So I did that and I traveled uh, the entire time I was on the road, you know, I was married then. My wife was a journalist. She was working for the, one of the Houston papers. She'd be in Cuba and I'd be in Guatemala or something. And that was our life. Wow. And it was enormously fulfilling. It was great fun. You know, you learn Spanish, you, you just hop off a plane and just do your work and file a story. And it was a good life. Yeah. You know, those jobs, there's not many of those jobs sure, left sure. anymore. They're always dangerous jobs, but People just can't afford to do it anymore. Yeah. Wow, what an experience. Yeah, <laughs> no it was clue fun. You did all that. That was a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yeah. cool. All right. Well, hey, let's uh, jump into some other topics here that uh, you gave us. And uh, let's start with uh, the legacy of big media and kind of the rise of new forms. Um, you've got your uh, Bakersfield Observed mm -hmm. program. And, and so, first off, how's that going? And uh, you seem to love. I love doing, doing it. it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, yeah. look, I'm retired now. Yeah. You know, I retired from the Californian. I did a little radio show for American General Media for five years, and I retired from that. So I've had my blog for, I think I started it in 08. Yeah. And here, here's something interesting you, you'll appreciate, being a businessman. The reason I started that blog was because, remember, this was in the middle of the recession, yeah. which started. We were laying off people right and left. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was a horrible time to be in any business, sure. you know, but particularly the newspaper business. And I was the CEO of the, of the company then. And I thought, well, I came up on the, I know how to write. I was, you know, I, I came up as a reporter. And so it was for me kind of a symbolic, all hands on deck. The CEO is going to write a blog. We were, I was asking everybody to do more, yeah. do more, 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 give me more. You know, I can't, I can't hire as many reporters. You're going to have to write more. So I did it myself. That started something that's been going since then. I've had a lot of fun with it. It keeps my hand in kind of news uh -huh. and topical stuff. And that's on bakersfieldobserved.com. Okay. And it comes out once a week. Well, I, I loved reading it in the paper prior to you, you, you know, I, I think going even to even doing it online with the blog. I just found it interesting because one of the biggest experiences I had with Bakersfield in this community was I, I did leadership Bakersfield. And I got to know, uh, that's my computer. Thing. <laughs> um, I got to know and see a different side of the community than where I was currently. And, and with your blog, it just seemed like there were so many interesting things that I wouldn't have learned from anybody else other than reading it, it, it you know, from you. You're very kind. Can I tell you a story? Sure. There was a guy, I don't know if you remember this guy, when I went to the Californian, he was an older gentleman. He was probably in his 70s and had a long career in the newspaper business. He was a business writer. He wrote weekly Sunday column about local business, and his name was Joe Stevenson. He wrote an article on me when I started my company. Okay. Yeah, oh my God. Wonderful guy. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful guy. And I was hired as the editor of, of the paper, and the then CEO, a guy named Mike Fish, every time he'd see me, he goes, Bean, what are you going to do about Joe? I said, what, what do you mean, what am I going to do about Joe? He goes, well, Joe's going to retire. And he goes, Joe knows everybody in town. Yeah. And the secret of Joe Stevenson was not that he was a great writer, but he was a great reporter. So if he wrote a story about 
Dave Pivlage, right? Yeah. And he knew your family. He would connect all the dots. Yeah. You know, yeah. Dave's wife does this. Dave's mom used to run this restaurant. And it was a way of connecting community. He was tr- he was name dropping, yeah. but not in a not in like I know somebody who is sure. important. Just saying, I took that to heart. And I yeah. said, well, what makes Joe so damn popular? And when I started the blog, I started to incorporate like, number one, I love local history. Yeah. So, you know, I would say this new restaurant's going on at the corner of so-and-so. 40 years ago, that used to be Lucky's Steakhouse or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Because yeah, people yeah. love that yeah, stuff. Yeah, People yeah, love kind of what makes our community tick yeah. what businesses are here we all root for new businesses we get they get excited when new restaurants come yeah. we're interested in what happened to the business owners yeah. and what they do and i took that from joe and i tried to apply it to my blog that it was a lot about people and names not not hugely significant stuff yeah. but stuff that makes friendships and it's 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 the grist of, of why we're successful here why people know each other yeah. here i wanted to make it like an afternoon at luigi's when you're sitting down with six people at lunch and you come back and you've learned a couple things yeah that's what i try to do yeah. on the blog wow yeah. i think you do a great job of well, thank it you. now talking about that you know i don't know if you've had a chance to listen to a podcast we recently just did one with uh key budge uh the marketing communica- mm-hmm. communications person with T- and with his podcast he's got so many people moving into the community from all over the state or or other states and don't know the history don't have that connection you know watching how our community has evolved um over the past few years just because of covid and, and all these people that can work remotely and so they're coming in droves here them getting a chance to um experience our community and learn about our community you know, so what are you seeing as far as the changing demographics of Kern County in that way? I mean, because we got, you know, they're outsiders, but they're becoming part of our community. And right. How do we, how do we en- envelope them into it? And, you know, that's a ownership. good question. I never really thought about that kind of how the pandemic and the whole, you know, I've, I have two daughters, both in the Bay Area, and both of them are now working from home and will continue to do so. And I look at that, Dave, and go, it's a whole sea change. But with that, as you know, that changes things. They're not going in an office. That's going to change society in some way. I don't know if it's significant or whatever. This community is changing, and it's changing more than just we're getting younger. We're getting browner. We're getting more democratic. Democratic, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, the politics are changing. Everything, the whole Cal- the whole West is changing like that. And I'm not a demographer. I think that the Bakersfield we're that you and I have lived in, if you're in your 50s or 60s, is going to be a really different place yeah. in like a generation or yeah. so. I th- I th- just think it's going to it it has to change. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. 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 In uh, what ways? I'm not sure, but clearly things have been evolving. You know, we see it more and more every day, and we weren't really used to it. I mean, there were pockets of it, I guess, but the homelessness here. What, what, what's your t- take on that? I mean, it, well, what, I've gotten what, a lot of trouble for, for my take on that because I don't, <laughs> I don't pull any punches on this thing. No, I'm, yeah. I, and I'm dead serious. Yeah. I think this has been a complete and utter failure on the part of society and particularly California. In fact, I'm reading a book now by Michael Schellenberger, who ran for governor of California. I think he only ran because he wanted to promote his book. Uh, it's a tremendous book called San Francisco and he is a former super liberal progressive who believed in the progressive causes who now looks back and says we have treated homeless just the worst way in our bid to recognize individual individuality or individual choice mm-hmm. well well first Schellenberger argues that what we do as a society is detrimental. For example, in the 80s, we decided as a society in California, the mental institutions were a bad thing because there had been some abuses. So we got rid of everything. You know, we're not, we're, we're not going to incarcerate oh, yeah. everybody. He would make a good argument in the book is that that's what we do because it makes us feel good. We're like, okay, we're done with this. Right. Now, right. of course, there's going to be, there's abuses everywhere. Every system is abused. It, but is that the reason, are you saying we can't take crazy people off the streets? We don't do that anymore. We've decided in California that incarceration is a bad thing. Going to prison is detrimental to minority groups or disproportionately detrimental 
detrimental to them or whatever, which is probably true, by the way. Does that mean we get rid of prisons? We're on the road now, and we're paying the price because our streets are filled up with people who used to be out with Lairdo with Donnie Youngblood. And Donnie Youngblood will tell you, he said, when they were out in Lairdo, I had, from their jail cell, they had access to alcohol treatment, mental health treatment, everything. Every provider was there at Lairdo. And what's our biggest problem now? Well, we have these people on the streets. We got to get them to their to the services. Well, they had the services, but they were in prison. So yeah. now we got to drag the services out to the bike path and, and pull them out of the river to do it. Yeah. I think here's my problem with it. And I, I, you know, I think this city has put an emphasis on, I'm glad we built these shelters, the county shelter and, and the city shelter. They're full. I'm all for that. I have no problem with that. The city strategy to the homeless a collaborative has been that this is a housing issue that if we can just get enough places for these people to live it'll be fine and i will tell you i had early on i had a woman a, a young lady from united way on my old radio show and i asked her this question because she's going to the housing thing and i'm thinking some of these people are batshit crazy yeah. they, there's no way they can live in yeah. there and i'll tell you if i were a landlord i wouldn't rent to them yeah and i asked her that question i said so if you have a thousand people on the waiting list and you have 10 units i'm assuming you're going to pick the 10 people out of those a thousand most likely to succeed in yeah. other words there's all kind of homeless there's the woman with four kids who who came behind you know got behind the rent who just wants to get a place those people that's what where we should be working then you got the crazy ones out in the middle of the chester dropping their drawers and taking a yeah. shit in the middle of the yeah. street yeah. right yeah. and those people aren't ready and i i asked this woman i said so you're going to put the people more likely to succeed, right? She goes, no, we don't believe that. They're all God's children that we should, like, give everybody a chance. I'm thinking, you're a bureaucrat. You're crazy. You can't put people who aren't ready into, a, into an apartment and expect them to succeed. My point is this. I think the emphasis to a large degree has been we've created this as a housing crisis. It's a mental health crisis. Yeah. It's a drug yeah. addiction crisis. Yeah. It's a fentanyl crisis. Yeah. You know. And when I talked to Andre Gonzalez, I live downtown. By the way, I should tell you something. I, I got pepper <laughs> sprayed by a tear gas guy at my house in my alleyway. But that's another story. You know. But <laughs> I'll tell you know. Andre, uh, Andre's like, well, we, we can't get sued. We can't get is so scared about telling these people to move on to get sued. And I think, well, that's interesting because you're not – city council people aren't worried about being sued when they draw – gerrymandered lines for their for their wards they'll let the dolores where to sue them and pay when they want something they'll say sue me but when they're scared let them sue us what's it going to hurt other communities have taken a much more active get these people off the street the fact dave now you got me going that we have (laughs) surrendered our parks now my my girls are older but if i The fact that I couldn't go to a park because I'm worried about razor blades in the sand or whatever, I use that bike trail through town every day. It is deplorable. Yeah. And I'm convinced the, the only reason people aren't up in arms is because very few people use this bike trail because it kind of goes out in some weird areas, sure. you know, and not everybody runs or, or bikes out there. So not a lot of people see it. Dave, it's a mess. Oh, yeah. It is. These camps are everywhere. These people are they're, they're, they're on drugs they're crazy there's these stray pit bulls everywhere yeah. it is a public shame and the fact that this city council and andre gonzalez or whoever, or whoever aren't more upset about this that my taxpayer dollars you yeah. know that built these parks that built all of these amenities that we can't use much much less the business people who come in every day and there's somebody sleeping on their doorstep yeah. i think we got to get much more active about this well i i i'm i'm glad we're having this conversation I, and i was hoping it would kind of go this way too a little bit because um you know i saw that you want to talk about the homeless issue and you know i went to lunch the other day with a client up on the east side um near 
the, our college. L.A., someplace else, I would have expected it. But I just, I, I just, I was shocked. I, I, I realize it's a reality. But walking across that parking lot, stepping over needles. I mean, I just, I'm like, yeah. what? <laughs> what? Yeah. And then, you know, it, let's touch on that. I, I haven't really followed what's happened too much out there. It, shelter on Brunage, the mm-hmm. old Calcott building. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I know it's gotten built and, and it is putting roofs over people's heads, but I, at least what I've heard, and I'm kind of curious what, what you've heard, but I've heard, you know, I, I know a guy that uh, is involved with a rehab house and, and some of his people that are at his rehab went out there to get off the streets and they had to leave because they were trying to become sober. People are shooting up and doing drugs in the bathrooms out there. All we did was just brought them all together in one yeah. place. And I apologize for not knowing this, but I don't know. Do What kind of programs do they have out there? Or is it really just, here's a place for all you all to be yeah, I, you not know, in our alleys downtown? Is that all we've done? Yeah, we just I'm, I'm the wrong do, person to ask. You're, you're going to have to get somebody yeah. else on. I do. I knew that they have certain, you know, you're not supposed to you're not supposed to do a lot of that stuff in there. And, yeah. and I get that. But your point is is valid in that we're bending over backwards to try to get these people to use our shelters, yeah. right? To the point where County Shelter over off M Street, off Golden State, yeah. is now going to, and I'm not necessarily against this, but it, it, it shows you what government will do to try to get these people in. We've got the shelter, got to go in there you can bring your dog we'll separate the dog you can bring your stuff we we built all these accommodations to overcome any obstacles that people might have homeless people say well i'm not going to go there because i can't take my dog okay you can bring your dog i'm not going to go there because i can't can't break my stuff okay you can bring your stuff now we've learned well a lot of them don't want to you know, they want to drink or they want to do whatever so now we're going to create a mini like outdoor park for them next to the normal facility so you have looser rules and that's where you're going to get into this kind of stuff it's like you know i understand what they're doing because they're they're trying what will it take to get these people off the streets because we are without a city council that says it's okay for a cop to go up there and nudge somebody sleeping on the doorstep and say you got to move on son yeah we won't do that now dave yeah that's madness yeah you know so we're begging people, please come to our shelter. It ain't going to work like that. Yeah. You're going to have to come down with a harder, because mm-hmm. a lot of these people just don't give a damn. Yeah. Now, I don't know what percentage of it is, but let's say that there's, my point, it doesn't need to be a large percent. How many homeless do they say we have in this town? I don't know. I don't know. know. Yeah. Just pick a number. Say we have 2,000 permanent homeless in this town. All you need is 10% or 5% of that, 100 people to be crazy to screw it up for everybody yeah you don't need many no you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. need many people attacking people on the bike path or dropping their drawers on chester to give the whole place a bad sense sure and that's exactly what's happening in new york that's the argument in new york that if you have you can have i have a friend who lives there he goes if you had 50 40 000 homeless people in new york and you had 50 of them who were batshit crazy and throw people in front of you know, subways and stuff, yeah. that's all you need. It doesn't take many to bring society, you know, to a halt there, right, you right, know, right. and that's, that's what we're facing. And I think that's the struggle at a lot of these homeless shelters, people. It wouldn't surprise me if they're, you know, I was playing pickleball the other day, uh, a couple of months ago at Jastro park, right? Yeah. Seven thirty in the morning. I use the bathroom over there, kind of going toward the racket club. Yeah. And I see these, you know, younger kids, you know, look like high school kids. I got closer and they, they weren't in school. They're all, sh- two of them were shooting up. You oh, know, geez. I walk right in, I take a pee, I leave. They don't blink an eye. And you know why? It's a misdemeanor. Yeah. You know, heroin is a misdemeanor. Yeah. I'm going back to Schellenberg's book that we have decided that we don't like prisons. We don't, we don't, we, we don't think drugs, you know, we shouldn't send, you know, people to jail uh for drugs so we de- decriminalize everything because it makes us feel good and now we're dealing with the consequences yeah, yeah. we're gonna have to find a way to kind of take it back a little bit take, yeah. you know yeah I, I think you're right a lot of it there is they they need those resources to help get them off but if those 
they've got no desire to get off. They don't want the help. Go. You know, they're they're living in a camping world, in, you know, in, in downtown Bakersfield. You know, you you go to Santa Barbara, and you, if you really stop at a signal light and you start looking what's up in the bushes. Yeah, they got yeah. perfect weather over and there. I'm Why not, wouldn't the homeless uh, want to be there? I mean, you know, I'm no psychologist or whatever, but Dave, you know, a lot of these people must be so far gone. Yeah. yeah. So far down the road, yeah. you know, the idea of a warm shower and a fresh meal doesn't appeal to them anymore. Yeah. They're just, you know, we've all gotten in funks. We've all gotten in yeah. ruts, you know, not like that, hopefully, yeah. but you know what I mean? I, yeah. it, it's human nature. And you have a large segment of society that is just checked out yeah. and is quite fine to sleep next to the freeway. Driving down the road and notice the age range too. I mean, you're talking people in their seventies, eighties, and then you're seeing kids, kids, you know, and, and I know I'm, I'm really involved with victory family services. So we do foster parent uh, training placement and then, and we also do adoptions. Uh, a great majority of our homeless are kids that have turned out, you know, Isn't hit that, that age. And, and they've learned those skills. They've, they, they, I mean, they're not, where do they go? I mean, yeah. they're a foster kid. They, right. they don't have family to go to. They right. don't have friends to go live with, you know. And so the streets is where they're going to. Yeah. I think people like Denandre Gonzalez, others people are doing the best they can. I, I just disagree. We cannot win this war on homelessness through appeasement. I yeah. just, I, I think we need a different tack. Yeah. I see Kevin McCarthy's name on here. I'm surprised to see Kevin McCarthy's name. What's your, what's your, I don't know. What do you think of Kevin McCarthy? Yeah. Uh, I, I really don't know him that well. I mean, I just, I know him in the, in the community. I see him, uh, you know, a, a uh, running fairly unopposed yeah. and keeps winning. I, I don't know what he's, uh, I don't follow politics to be quite honest. So I really don't know what he's accomplished or what his, uh, his, uh, goals and objectives are now. I, I guess he just ran unopposed, right? No, no, he, no. he'll have, he'll have a, a token democratic opposition. Okay. And, you right. know, I think he had 57% of the vote or whatever. Here's, oh, here's my deal with Kevin and I've known Kevin for a long time. I think Kevin, McCarthy is a good person, an honorable man. I know his wife, who everybody adores. His his mom is a wonderful lady. I didn't know his late dad. Uh, I came here in 94. Kevin was always, I viewed Kevin as he was a disciple of Bill Thomas, yeah. which made him kind of, you know, a progressive Republic, moderate Republican. That's kind of where my politics are. Yeah. You know, that's fine. You know, uh, certainly not, a not, uh, not wacky, not crazy, whatever. And January six comes along and Kevin's re initial response to the riots at the Capitol were spot on. He was horrified. He, he knew, Trump had stepped over the line. Yeah. He called out Trump in the well of Congress. Uh, he's been picked up on tapes, you know, all saying the right thing. Yeah. Just, just yeah. This, this is wrong. This is bad for society. And the fact that he has now chosen to, to turn on that, to, to choose his party over country, to choose Donald tr loyalty to Donald Trump over the, uh, the good of the country, I think is a horrible mistake, a horrible flaw. And I say this with all due respect because I think Kevin is a good man, you know, but he has made a decision which I think will haunt him the rest of his life. I think because I'm in the business, I used to write obits at the LA times for a while, you know, and if you look at your life, Dave, everybody should look at their life at some point and go, if I died tomorrow, what would my obit read like, oh, wow. you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what would it say about us and our character and our friendships and whatever? And let's say you're a politician like Kevin McCarthy. Well, you know, Richard Nixon's obit, you know, which was already read Donald Trump's obit is, obviously going to say he was impeached you know yeah. and kevin mccarthy's obit is going to and he will become speaker and good for you kevin you know but at what price yeah. dave you know one one thing age and time and experience teaches you is we only have one thing in our life and that's our character that is it. Yeah. It's the single thing we have control over. We don't have control over our health, 
You know, we don't have control over who hires us. Uh, we don't have control over how other people perceive us, but we do have control over our character and how we treat other people. And you just hope for the best and, and character of doing the right thing, being honest, man. And I think Kevin McCarthy has violated that. And I think it's going to haunt him. I think history is going to judge him harshly as an opportunist, as a guy who put the Republican party and his desire to be speaker of the house over what is what was a damn near insurrection whether whether donald trump was an opportunist or he was he was involved in it whatever yeah uh these january 6 hearings his you know even his daughter has turned on him i think kevin mccarthy's going to come out looking like a quizzling you know a guy who who chooses something else over his country and i think it's a shame yeah. now he's going to do what he wants he doesn't listen to me he doesn't care what i yeah i, I, I say but that's my view of it. Uh, I just, I, for me, like I said, I, I really don't follow politics. I mean, but but f- f- what I see, which is disheartening, is I, you know, we've gotten so divided as opposed to the politicians working for us as a whole, as a country. Yeah. You know, and I just, I, I feel like we've just gotten. It's a horrible time. Everybody is, let me tell you, it, it, I haven't felt like this since. I'm going to go back. The Rodney King riots. I was in, I was working at the LA Times during oh, wow. the Rodney King riots. I think that was 92, oh, wow. yeah. like, I think. I'm not sure. Um, and at that time in LA, Dave, you couldn't go to a gas station to fill up. I wouldn't make eye contact with black and white people wouldn't even look at each other. It was so, so tense. The 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 racial you know, element in, in the room was just, it was like, if you lit a match, the whole place would explode. It was a dangerous, uncomfortable place. And I feel that's what America's we've gotten back to where, Uh, you know, we can't, we can't have a discussion, you know, we can't have, if you don't agree with me, you're the devil or you're a communist or, you know, we'll label you some kind of, yeah. you're, you're a rhino, you're not a real Republican or this name calling is bullshit. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's so demeaning to us as a people. I, I know where my politics are and I have a lot of friends who are way to the left of me and a lot of friends who are way to the right. right. But I, I think I get it all. Yeah. I think I understand. I don't agree with it, yeah. but I don't think these are bad people. Who, yeah. who believe like that. I just think that they have had a different life experience. It gives them different reasons to think think differently. But most of America now, we're just at each other's throats. Yeah, and it's, it doesn't matter what it is. And it's, it's so abortion. Can we talk about the world, Dave? I mean... We, we, we got the January 6th commission. You got the war in Ukraine. You got $10 gallon gas. You know, this incredible inflation. We're coming out of the pandemic. You know, yeah. when we came out of the pande- pandemic and then the Ukraine war started, I told my wife, I said, God hates us. <laughs> I mean, we, we just get through yeah. the pandemic yeah. and damn, and this miss. war starts yeah. over here and gas goes to $10 again. No, yeah. it... But we're on edge here, and we've got to, man, I we, we've got to learn to step back from the brink here, and learn to not love each other but respect each other. Because you know, I don't agree with a lot of what is certainly you know AOC says, you know, or or Shannon Grove. Mm-hmm. I don't agree. I, I'm in the middle of both of them, yeah. but I understand them. Sure. I think Shannon Grove is representing an important constituency here. It's not my constituency. They're way farther right than me, but I get it and I respect it. I think AOC is representing some people that, you know, not me either, right. you know, and I don't agree with her, but I respect it yeah. because we, we live in a really complex society of 340 million people or whatever. There's a lot of stuff going on here and a lot, you know, living on South side of Chicago is a lot different than living in Hagen Oaks, exactly. you know, yeah. and you got to factor all that in. That doesn't make us evil or bad because we have an opposing view about 
what a level of assistance should be for poor people or whatever it is, you know, but man, we're at each other's throats here. I think it's a dangerous time. I do too. It it feels like, you know, we've gone lots of steps backwards and, and, you know, I mean, I grew up in West Virginia and, you know, things that, you know, I saw growing up and then coming out here to California, it just, it's, it's just so diverse. And, and even when it came to, uh, uh, races and, you know, getting along, I think there was something about back East that kind of had gotten past a lot of that. It seemed like, you know, growing up and then came out here and it's like, then I was starting to see like this division. It's like, why you you know, you're in California, you should all be getting along great. And I mean, you know, you got a great place to live and, and it just, I don't know. I just, I, I see, I, I just feel like we've gone backwards and, and, and well, we regards. could go, we could spend a whole podcast on we the could. woke culture or identity <laughs> politics, but we, uh, could. we, we could, you know, we can do better than that as so, a society. Um, all right, let me go. I got a couple other questions for you here before we uh, start getting towards wrapping up. Um, you know, we have what we call the rapid fire questions, and you pretty much already answered uh, some of those. But uh, about something that nobody knows about you. I mean, like I didn't know that you, you know, were foreign correspondents. I didn't know you worked down in LA either during Rodney King deal. I mean, that's pretty wild. What else would you say? Somebody be like, "No way, Richard Bean, really? Nobody would know this." But I, uh, when I was sixteen years old, I shot competitive skeet. And I shot competitive skeet for years and as a junior, and I was the junior state Georgia 20 gauge champion in skeet shooting. How about that? That's pretty awesome. That's pretty cool, I, huh? I don't know if you saw my soul's me. I picked up on clay shooting. I know. I, like, that's the reason I, I had you. The hoot. I saw you out <laughs> of the gun club. All right. I'm gonna have to, we're going to have to have more of that discussion yeah. offline. That's not going to be better. Um, but you will understand this uh, growing up in West Virginia that, you know, I grew up. In Georgia, in a culture of guns. Yeah. Guns don't scare me. Yeah. I'm comfortable around guns. I hunted as a child. My father taught me how to use and, and, and the importance of safety and how the unloaded gun kills and kills the most. You never point anything. The chamber's always open, all that stuff. Yeah. And yet, I have friends. Uh, my best friend's uh, wife grew up in Chicago in what she calls kind of the, you know, the Jewish enclave. Nobody had a gun. No, I mean, my point is her experience as an American right. was totally different than mine. Correct. Yeah. And that's yeah. where we get on these second amendment issues. Yeah. You know, I look on the second amendment in a way different way than, yeah. than, than most people right. would. You know? right. There you go. Um, See, I've got my own questions here, but uh, I'm going to ask kind of our group questions that we typically ask. Uh, what's the best advice you've ever received? Uh, I okay. Here's this is. Thank you for asking for that. It's a guy named John Opadal. John Opadal was the executive editor of the Dallas Times Herald. I was living in Madrid, and I wanted to get back to the states. And I applied for, actually, that's what got me to Mexico City. I wanted to get back to working for a stateside company. But um, so I was applying for this job in Mexico City as the bureau chief for the Dallas Times Herald. And a guy named John Opadal was the executive editor. So I flew from Madrid to Dallas, right? Like landed, got off the plane, you know, went straight to dinner. Right. I mean, I was barely awake oh, right, for this important <laughs> job I really wanted. I did get, thank God. But during this interview process, he asked me this, this question. And the question was this. He goes, what's the best book you've ever read? And I'm like, well, I mean, I've read a lot of books. I mean, and it depends on kind of where you are. Sure in life what yeah. was you know maybe Kerouac's on the road was important when I was 22 yeah. but maybe not when I was 42 yeah. you know things like that I only mentioned that not not for that question but John Opadal later that guy who asked me that question gave me the best advice I was trying I was a reporter then I was a correspondent and I wanted to move into editing and and I was asking Opadal because he was a mentor to me I said John what do I how do I get from here to there? How do I, I want to be the boss. How do I get there? And among other things he told me to do, well, two things he told me, he said, learn to work with money, 
you need to you need you need to be you need to have a budget under you. You know, show that you're responsible yeah. in an organization that you can be responsible for money. And this other thing was broader. He said, you know, you got to be more well rounded. He said, read everything. I said, well, what do you mean read everything? He said, read things you're not comfortable with. He says, if you're in an airport, this is back when books were big, and you you don't know anything about planes, and you see an airplane magazine you know, read it, you know, you'd be surprised what you learn, read everything, read things you don't agree with. I mean, he just like everything, anything you can get your hands on. And that turned out for me to be like really important because over the years I have always occasionally, not all the time, opted for things that I'm not interested in, but I, I feel like I need to know that yeah. I need to broaden myself to be, not that I know, you know, I could tell tell the sound of an F eight, F four, Phantom, and a MiG twenty four, you know, even though at one time I could. Uh, wow! But you know, it, it it was it was just this general. It, it wasn't job specific, but more like be curious, you know, ask questions, yeah. do more, yeah. do more than it's expected, yeah. and that's what yeah. I got out of that. Learn something, you John don't know. Great guy, excellent. Um, all right, hold on, my phone went dead on me here. My other question. Uh, that was one of my favorites. Music. What 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 was that? What's that little secret hidden guilty pleasure that you're like everybody like, whoa, Richard likes he listens to Cindy Lauper like every day? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, what is it? I don't know if there is. Uh I listen to a lot of serious satellite radio, a lot of coffee, yeah. coffee house stuff. Okay. You know, I like acoustic stuff. I like Americana. I, pr- I probably follow some people you wouldn't even know. Jill Andrews, you know, used to be with a band called the Everybody Fields. You know, uh, I love female singers. Uh, I love country western. You know, so no, there, there's no there, there, there's no big thing. Yeah. But I have a pretty eclectic taste yeah. i like a lot of stuff i know? do too it's yeah. hard for me to go what what, what what genre or whatever i'm like there's just so much of it <laughs> exactly <laughs> right i could tell you what i don't like but yeah. you know other stuff i mean that was always my fascination like when when pandora and some of those streaming services came out that you know you sit there and like music and then like all of a sudden it's like I've never heard of this band before. I know. And that's the great thing about, you know, online stuff and the demo data that they're getting from us. They're right. I mean, if 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 you like this song and a million other people like this song or 10,000 like this song, we bet you're going to like this one too. I'm like, oh my God, you're right. You know, and I, you know, I just say, I, I love that part of it. You I know, do to, I do too. I love the Alexis, yeah. you know, Alexis will say, what well, do you want to hear songs like that? Yeah. Yeah. Go yeah. for it. Yeah. <laughs> Bring I'm it on. I'm Bring in. It on. I think, uh, What's one thing you would change or hope to see over the next year or two? No, I, I think I mentioned it before, just the level of uh, civil discourse has yeah. to improve. Yeah. We're going to kill ourselves in this country. Yeah. And, and it's such a, I'm going to wave the flag a little bit. You know, this is a remarkable country we live yeah. in, Dave. It really is. And America is on this, uh, do you know what the, <laughs> you heard of the, like the the march of the martyrs mm. it's a religious ceremony that in iran that that uh certain religions do and and they'll the guys you've seen them they've stripped off their their shirts and they'll march down with chains and machetes and they're like cutting themselves in the oh, head okay. yeah. you know showing yeah. their 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 loyalty to the religion or whatever and i feel like america has gotten we're just bloodying ourselves up yeah. you yeah. know and there's there's through identity politics and 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 focusing on what's wrong instead of what's right yeah you know i hate that i mean personally when i hear about and i understand that there's inequities and still grievances and we've got a long ways to go but my goodness when i look back how far we've come since i was born growing up in the deep south right I grew up during the civil rights stuff, you know. Yeah. I mean, I went to college at a place where there was a liquor store with a black entrance and a white entrance. Oh, wow. L- literally. Yeah. Literally. Yeah. In, in South Georgia. That stuff hung on for a while. And 
we've come, I think there's so much to celebrate that I'm, I'm not one of those guys who's just going to beat ourselves up because we're not perfect. Nobody's perfect. Yeah. No society is perfect. But this wonderful experiment of a country from founded, you know, by these incredible, you know, these founding fathers who are now tearing down their statues mm -hmm. because of something they said 300 years ago, 250 yeah. years ago or whatever is ridiculous. I hope we can, I hope we can step back from the brink and understand that, you know, most people mean good and are good. Yeah. And the fact that somebody wasn't perfect, you know, a hundred years ago, you know, that, we can't judge them now, Dave. No, learn and grow. We, we learn weren't and grow. there, yeah. you know, and I think it's a really dangerous uh, trend that seeps into the schools, seeps into the curriculum. You, yeah. you end up with this like systemic self-hatred, yeah. you know, yeah. and I think that's horrible for this yeah. country. I hope we can get past that. I know you've traveled a lot, you know, and I, you know, I've been very fortunate to be able to travel through a lot of places, like through Rotary and stuff like that. Always coming home, it's just like, oh my God, we, yeah. we got it so good here. I, I mean, know, you know, I mean, I've been in some beautiful places, but boy, I'm glad to come home. Yeah, like, and wow. I and I want to say this, since this is a Bakersfield uh, uh, broadcast, my wife, I, I remarried five years ago. Thank God, I found somebody who would have me, <laughs> and uh, she's from here. Yeah. And she'll go, God, you've lived all over. I said, you don't kind of why did you settle here, or or, or what's it like? I'll, I go, sweetie, this is. This is a great place, yeah. you know. Yeah. I have really lived in some dogs in this country. Oh, okay. <laughs> I mean, I have. I lived in some really small town America. This is not one of them. Yeah. We've got bad air. We got some, you know. But you know what? We're in California, guys. Yeah. You know, this is not a bad place uh, to be, and it's a beautiful place. And there's things. It's the outdoor lifestyle, and I'm for one happy to be here, yeah. and I ain't going anywhere, and. I, one of the things that really bothers me is when you find these people, and you know them, Dave, and I know them, who people are leaving Bakersfield and they're like, yeah. I'm, oh, I'm finally moving to Santa Barbara or whatever, you yeah. know. And, I, and and all they do is trash, you know, trash Bakersfield. Yeah. And, you know, they're somewhat smarter over there and whatever. Well, people go over there. They're not any happier. No, no. You, you know, no. your zip code doesn't determine your happiness. No, it you doesn't. You know, I mean, it's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So I... I, I I'm a big fan of where we are. You know, it's not perfect, but what place is. Yeah. And I think you're happy, as you say, when you come home and you're flying over, you know, Meadows Field, you go, I'm home, baby. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, it's great. All right, what are your next goals and steps for you? I mean, I, I know you're retired, but you've got your, your radio program. You I got your wait to be invited be... back here on the, the, the uh, <laughs> this podcast. You know? Thank you for having me. All right, perfect. Yeah, no, I, it, it was a pleasure having you today, bud. I, I always enjoy our conversations. You're good. You're good at this. <laughs> you are. I'm trying. Anyways, thanks for listening, Thank and you. we're out. This show has been brought to you by the Law Office of Kyle Jones, Troy Burton with The Lynn Company, CPA John Duffield, Scott Hansen Real Estate Lender, Broker and Investor, and Dave Plivlich, President and CEO of the Marcom Group and MarcomBranding.com. You've been listening to the Our Two Cents podcast. Check out the show notes for links and more information about the show. Also visit our website at OurTwoCentsPodcast.com or catch us on Instagram at our Two Cents Podcasts. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and share with others.